humanizing dogs is the biggest disservice that we can do to them, you know, and, and that is because I feel like there's a certain level of expectation that comes with humanizing those dogs that dogs are just never going to be able to meet. Hi, I'm Tori Mystic, and you're listening to the Wear, Wag, Repeat podcast, the only show dedicated to supporting women in all areas of the pet industry. Welcome to another episode of the Wear, Wag, Repeat podcast. Today, I am sharing a conversation with Chicago-based canine behavior specialist, Daphne Mendoza. Daphne is all about spreading the message of responsible dog ownership. What captivates me about Daphne's story is her background and the unique cultural influences that she brings to the table. Growing up in Mexico City, she had a real hands-on experience with dogs because her grandfather was actually the chief of police. Together, they would catch stray dogs, get them spayed or neutered, and then either find them new homes or set them free again, which was customary in Mexico City. These experiences combined with her own journey as an immigrant to the United States inspired her to start her own successful dog training business that really filled a gap in the marketplace. She is not afraid to call out the lack of diversity in the industry. Coming from an indigenous background herself, Daphne is all about pushing for inclusivity and a more community-focused approach. Throughout our chat, Daphne really drives home the importance of being a responsible pet owner. She challenges the whole idea of treating dogs as, quote, fur babies. Personally, I can't stand that term anymore. I'm sorry, guys. I just can't. And Daphne emphasizes the need to move from fur babies to the need to respect our dogs as individuals. I really like this. It resonates with me so much. In this conversation, we also dig into the challenges of having dogs in the city and how crucial it is for them to have proper space and exercise. Daphne's training approach revolves around incorporating dog care into everyday life, making sure that our pups can be themselves while still thriving in their urban surroundings. This conversation with Daphne will leave you reflecting on the pet industry and the changes that we can make for the better. I hope that you will share what you think about this conversation with me in a couple different ways. One, you can reach out to me on social media. I'm on Instagram at where wag repeat. You can find me on TikTok TikTok at where wag repeat as well. You can also leave a review for this show on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave reviews in Spotify. I'm pretty sure. Leave a review anywhere that you can. And of course, you're always welcome to continue the conversation in the free Facebook group called Wear, Wag, Repeat Labs. That's also just a great way to connect with other women in the pet industry, ask questions, and share what's working for you. All right, without further ado, let's get into this conversation with Daphne. Daphne Mendoza is a local dog trainer in the Chicagoland area and has been an active member of the pet service industry for 13 years. She graduated from Fetch Find Academy as a behavior specialist, as well as Mike Shikashios. I think I'm saying his name wrong, but Daphne will correct me later. His aggression in dogs master course. She specializes in city dog training and managing high stress and high anxiety situations. Daphne has developed a unique perspective as a trainer where she emphasizes the importance of communication, team-centric activities, and living a dog trainer life. Hi, Daphne. Hello, hello. I'm happy to be here. So please tell me once again, I know I asked you 14 times before I hit record, how do you say Mike's last name? Uh, Shikashio. Okay. (laughs) And don't worry, you know, I I know a lot of people that when I talk about it, they have a hard time, you know, so, you know, they're, they're totally good. I'm sure he doesn't. It's just, I don't know why. I was just really like stumbling over his name, but I want to make sure we got it right. And of course, we'll put links in the show notes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about your career and your experiences in the pet industry. Um, maybe we can start off um, and I can ask you kind of how you got into the pet industry. What inspired you to become a dog trainer? Yeah, you know, it it really, it's going to sound a little cheesy, but it was really just fate, 
you know, um, I grew up in Mexico City. I immigrated here when I was about 10 years old. And my grandfather from my mom's side, he was a chief of police in Mexico. So I grew up around uh, Rottweilers, you know, uh, Dobermans, all kinds of canines all over the place. And then on the other side, my grandfather and I, from my dad's side, uh, we used to live near this national park in Mexico. Um, and a lot of people, unfortunately, would dump dogs there. And that would create a problem for the neighborhood because obviously a lot of these dogs were in neuter or spade. So then we'd have packs of dogs. And so me and my other grandfather, we would, um, you know, work with them to try to capture them and get them neutered or spayed. And then we would re-release them or find them home. So I feel like from a very young age, I was just kind of exposed to, you know, both sides of, you know, rescue as well as dog training. And, uh, you know, when I came here, because I'm undocumented, I wasn't able to, you know, find like a quote unquote real job. Um, and so I was like, well, what can I do to, you know, help my family, pay for college? And I started dog walking in Wrigleyville um, from Chicago. And so somehow, again, as fate would have it, I, I ended up getting just all the reactive dogs and just, you know, referral after referral. I actually ended up owning my own dog sitting company and dog walking company. And yeah, um, eventually when DACA, the deferred action program that passed, I was able to get a social security number. So I was able to start working in the field and I've worked anywhere from boarding facilities to, you know, groomer assistants, um, you know, pretty much every field in the pet industry. So I feel like I have a pretty well-rounded, um, you know, background. And, you know, I finally decided why not make this a career? And I signed up for Fetch Find Academy and graduated there a couple of years ago and, you know, never turned, never turned back. Oh my gosh, what a story. And, and overcoming such adversity of, you know, not having the right documentation to work somewhere and just kind of making it work on your own. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's survival. You know, it's something that, you know, me and my, my family really, you know, have had to do since, since we came here and, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have found my passion at such a young age and, you know, kind of just find my purpose. And, you know, now I'm, I, I own my own company now and that's, uh, it's, it's the best experience I have ever made. And I'm incredibly proud of myself. Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of you. And I just met you. Um, I bet your family is really proud of you as well. Yes. You know, funny enough, like at the beginning, you know, I remember when I told my mom, I was like, Hey, you know, college is expensive. Dog walking doesn't pay that well. I don't know if I want to continue. And, you know, she was a little disappointed at that, but, you know, as she's seen me grow and, you know, she tells me every day, just seeing, you know, your videos and see how passionate you are about what you do. That's really all I can ask for as a mother is just that you're doing something that makes you happy. What were you going to college for? Um, so I initially wanted to be a defense lawyer. Um, that was, uh, you know, first I kind of wanted to do what my grandpa did and work with the canine unit. Um, but then I was like, well, I can't really join the police force being undocumented. So I'm like, well, let's see if I can, you know, make my way through school and, you know, again, law school and all that stuff gets expensive. So, you know, I finished maybe like three years. Um, and then I decided to, you know, go to go to fetch fine academy and you know I, I ended up interning for them as well because i was like again like you know dog walking doesn't pay that well uh so i ended up landing an internship with them and they were able to kind of you know trade me working for them and and go to school yeah yeah oh, well that's so interesting and i just think like that interest in like the law and then your interest in animal welfare like there's such overlap like who knows where what you might do with that later in your career yeah, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to doing more youth programs, especially for the Latino community. You know, I, I really want to give back to um, my community and offer opportunities that I just didn't have growing up. Okay, so you have kind of like, uh, you're a very determined person <laughs> who, um, you know, wants to pursue your dreams and you're going to make it happen and you're going to work and, and and make it happen. But I'm, I'm sure that there are, um, you know, different roadblocks along the way. And you were kind of talking to me a little bit before we hit record. And and I wanted to make sure that we cover this in this episode because it's such an important topic, um, which is just, um, you know, the inclusivity of the pet industry and how it can be hard for a person of color to succeed in this industry. And I can't speak about that firsthand, but you can. So um, I'd love to kind of hear your insights on that and um, and maybe some suggestions on on what we could all be doing to improve the the culture of the pet industry. 
Yeah, you know, of course. And and, and I, I think that is something that I think from the last year, it has something, it's been something that has been truly magnified. It's kind of like taking the, the red pill in the matrix. You know, it's like once you start seeing these problems, you really see like the roots of, you know, our white supremacist system kind of has influence on everything. You know, there's very much just one lens and that is, you know, the way that white people view things. Um, and so, you know, with my experience, you know, has been a lot of like hands on. Uh, and, you know, obviously I'm a dog trainer. So, you know, I could obviously talk about this for hours, but, you know, focusing on the dog training aspect of this, something that I've realized is that, you know, the dog training industry is a very white centric um, industry where it's like we mostly white women dominated. And that also sometimes means that there's just like, you know, just one or two particular training styles that are, you know, uh, that are accepted, you know? And so, you know, I feel like for me, I, I bring a very different background because indigenous people, you know, had animals way before white people discovered the science before that, you know? So, you know, growing up, I feel like, you know, I've, I've heard from a lot of other white professionals talk about how, like, you know, when they were younger coming up, like, you know, what they had like those old methods of like, Oh, you know, if a dog pees, you kind of like, you know, whack him with the newspaper and you're like, Hey, don't do that. You know? And, uh, I feel like, you know, in, in America, the way that people own dogs is very differently than than people in other countries, right? Like, and so I think that because in other countries, dogs are, are used as like tools and companions, the way that we treat them is way more inclusive within our family circle rather than they're just kind of like a pet that's off to the side. Um, and so, you know, even just in the in the in uh, in the industry that I've been, when I you know go to events, like I I just started getting into dog sports, which is so fun. Um, but you know, it's very rare that I see another person of color there. Um, you know, it's it's very rare that people of color even have the financial means to be able to even do a lot of these activities, you know, um, or just like the time. Um, so something that I feel like it would be a good solution to this is, is exactly what we are doing right now. And that is just starting conversations and, you know, understanding that there's way more than just one ideology of doing things correctly, you know, and I think that sometimes it's hard for people to accept that, um, that, you know, if we live in a world that's very just one lens and then there are very various other views on how to do things that is still, you know, humane and it still puts the dogs first and it's, it's just a different way. Right. And I think that by also opening up these spaces to communities, you know, I, uh, I'm going to be opening a center with Tara actually called the canine corridor where we're going to be offering uh, dog sports there to try to bring some of that dog fun to, you know, lower income communities, or again, just like, you know, my, my people, you know, and being able to offer, um, services that are in Spanish, you know, services that, you know, I, I offer sliding scale pricing for all of my sessions, all of my classes, because I want everything to be accessible. And I feel like that's something that, uh, you know, in, in, for people of color, where we always view ourselves as a community versus I feel like when it comes to white people, it's very much an individualistic um, you know, ideology. So I feel like just us starting conversations like this is really the best way for us to start getting more ideas and get everybody into this bandwagon of like, hey, hanging out with dogs is awesome. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There, you just touched on so many things. Um, oh my gosh. Where do I start? So um, you were talking about how, you know, in in like white culture in America, we very much think of these dogs as like our pet or a property, like really, um, and how just different it is in different cultures. And I, I really, that was so interesting to point out. And I think that, you know, you touched on indigenous people and just having more respect is for animals as, you know, part of our community animals are part of our lives. And, and I think that also touches on like that, just respect for the natural world, which includes animals and includes us and everything. Um, and that is such a just more holistic way to live our lives, not just with our pets, but just in general. And it kind of made me wonder too about, um, you know, everyone, everyone loves this whole, like my dog is my child kind of thing. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel like it's a little problematic. Like I don't, I know the word dog mom is like definitely all over my website and my social media, but I don't, I use it because everyone understands what it means. I don't really like the term dog mom because my dogs aren't my children. Um, they're their own beings that, uh, 
gave me permission that I could like live amongst them. It's very different. Um, there, I don't think of them as my kids. Like they're not my fur babies. Um, you know, and, and I think that they are other beings that we have to respect and that we can learn from, not that you can't learn from children as well, but it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's a weird cultural perspective. Um, and I feel like it is problematic and, and people get so defensive because they're like, this is my child. <laughs> and it's like, well, it's really not. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I can't tell you how many times I have to kind of, you know, bring that to, to certain people. And I, I completely agree with you. You know, I think that humanizing dogs is the biggest disservice that we can do to them, you know, and, and that is because, I feel like there's a certain level of expectation that comes with humanizing those dogs that dogs are just never going to be able to meet, you know? And, you know, unfortunately, again, like with, with how Americans view pet ownership, you know, I think that the, the excitement of having this pet kind of drizzles off for a lot of people. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people I have super excited to be like, Oh yeah, I'm in puppy classes. Maybe the first two years of their dog's life, they're like, I'm gun ho about it. And then they just kind of become part of the physical home, right? Like the dog is just kind of here. Um, and you know, for indigenous people, it's, it's not necessarily a commodity that we can afford, right? Like dogs are not necessarily uh, a luxury thing that we can afford for ourselves. So I feel like a lot of times we end up having a dog for some kind of purpose. And, and for us growing up in my family, dogs were always, you know, in, in Mexico, we never fed dogs kibble. They ended up eating the stuff that we ate ourselves. You know, it's like whatever was left over is like, Hey, here you go. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were very much, you know, treated as a member of the family, but it's still acknowledging that they are an animal, you know, and that they have very different, you know, I don't want to say lives, but very different ways of thinking and ways of like existing. So yeah, I completely agree with you with the whole like fur mommy and, you know, all that things, you know, my, my dogs, you know, I don't want to say like are my literal children, but I'm like, Hey, yeah, I'm a dog mom. I like, you know, I, I personally don't want any human children. I think that I'm here in life to serve dogs and just have them be my companions, um, but yes, it definitely does it at the service for, you know, for humans to, 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 to infantilize them. Yes. Yeah. I think that the dog mom and pet parent, you know, I, I identify more with that than like pet owner. Um, but neither of them really, I think are a great fit. And I, and you just, you, you got me thinking here about so many things, but, um, you know, talking about how people, you know, a lot in, in white American culture are excited about their dog for the first couple of years. And I think it is all kind of tied into the like capitalism and like, what can you afford? And like, I'm going to buy this leash. I'm going to buy this thing. I'm going to buy this treat. I'm going to buy a designer dog. I'm going to buy the best private lessons money can buy. Um, and it's so different than having this like community approach, like you're talking about of like, you know, making things accessible and inclusive. And um, maybe your dog is not just existing only for you individually, but it's like part of your community and kind of teaching people together. Um, Cause it is important that everyone um, knows how to respect dogs, not just like the dog owner, dog parent or whatever. Um, yeah. You, you, you have some, like, you've got me thinking about things that we don't usually talk about on the podcast. So this is awesome. Yeah, it's important. You know, I, I love that you mentioned, you know, that the dogs are part of the community. You know, I think that something that people don't talk about, it's the social responsibility that you have when you become, and I call myself like a pet mentor, right? I'm like, hey, like I, I am showing you like dogs are already great thing at one thing and that's being a dog. You know, it, and, and I feel like, you know, we as, you know, pet mentors need to be like, hey, this is how you live the human life. You know, this is how you incorporate yourself into life by your side, especially for city dogs. You know, the city is not made for a, for a dog, you know, especially a lot of these breeds that people get because they're cool. But there is just such a, a huge social responsibility. And I think that, you know, why America's idea of individualism really affects that community aspect, um, especially because, you know, and again, you know, personally, I've any off leash dog that I've ever had run to me has always been a white owner or a white pet mentor, you know, and at the time, you know, me being a person of color, I always have to be the person that's like, hey, like, you know, can you like, 
very respectfully, I have to kind of ask people to like, you know, pull their dog back. And I'm always kind of met with some level of aggression, you know, because I shame them. Right. Uh, I've even call, gotten the cops called on me for simply asking a person to leash your dog up. Um, and, you know, obviously that comes with the problem of like the rude dog, like what, what people call the friendly dog problem. But I just think it's just like the rude dog problem. Right. And it's that sense of entitlement that, you know, I'm here with my dog and I get to do whatever I want and just let them off leash without having that social responsibility of not wanting to bother other people or having them invade other people's space. So I think until we start talking about the social responsibilities and the, you know, racial influences, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to make this world into a nice, safe environment for all dogs, you know, because I'm like, if, if I have taken the time and energy to, you know, train maybe my reactive dog who's wearing a muzzle and everything to be, you know, off leash in this big space, you know, it's my responsibility to keep them under control, but that, that, that dog also has the right to be able to live a fulfilling life without somebody else invading, you know, our space. Yeah, no, that's, that's really accurate. And I think that that attitude of just like, I'm going to do whatever I want um, is detrimental to people and their pet and your pet. It's just, it, it puts everyone in danger. And, and like what I see happening here in Pittsburgh, there's so many places where dogs are not permitted at all anymore. And it's because of people who, you know, one person ruined it for everyone else because they couldn't respect others. It's not about following the rules. It's just about like respecting other people. Yes. Yeah. yeah, respect is such, is such a thing that, you know, I feel like it's, it's lost, you know, and, and empathy. I feel like those are two very big values that are part of my own, um, you know, journey as a dog trainer. You know, I'm like, those are, you know, empathy, trust and respect are my three biggest values that I go by whenever I'm working with, you know, another team. Um, just because those are values that if we all just thought to practice them every day, like the world will be a better place for everybody. Yeah, I know. We make it too complicated. So, so something that you specialize in is training city dogs. Um, so what are some of the unique challenges that that brings? Um, you know, how, how is it different for people with city dogs versus suburban or rural dogs? You know, the biggest thing I will say is space, you know, and space when it comes to being able to, you know, exercise your dog and fulfill them correctly versus, you know, dogs just being so close to triggers, dogs being so close to, you know, things that are exciting or scary. Um, and so, you know, for me, that is the biggest, um, kind of like roadblock for every dog out here, because, you know, I, I know that a lot of trainers don't consider, I don't want to call it obedience, right? Because for me, obedience, it's just language. Like me teaching a dog to sit down, whatever. That's just me teaching a language, right? And so I know a lot of, you know, industry people that, you know, think that like, well, just let them be a dog. Let a dog be a dog. You know, don't focus too much on obedience. But, you know, in the city, we have to heavily rely on that obedience just because for me, that communication builds trust, right? Like if I'm, you know, in a, uh, in a, um, building downtown and I have to get out and my dog is incredibly reactive. I can't get 40 feet away to make sure that my dog is on their threshold, you know, but if I can build a very reliable, you know, relationship with my dog and have my dog understand that like, Hey, if I ask you to sit at this corner of the elevator, that means good things happen all the time. And that means that you can trust me anytime that a sit happens that I think reduces the risk of, you know, dogs, uh, not feeling safe or, you know, making mistakes. Um, and so to me, that is one of the biggest challenges is like, we don't have the space to be able to let just dogs be dogs because it's unsafe, you know, for them to just like, you know, run away into the street if they get scared, you know? So, um, you know, and, and a lot of city people also like, I love that you mentioned capitalism, <laughs> um, because, you know, a lot of people work a lot living in the city, you know, living in the city is, is expensive. And so a lot of people also don't have necessarily maybe even the time to do a lot of stuff for their dog outside of like having to work, taking care of just regular life stuff. And, you know, the last three years have been intense for a lot of people, for everybody, you know? Um, so I feel like space and time are really just the biggest factors in here, which is why my training is very much about lifestyle. You know, I, I practice what I preach every single day. You know, I, when I was a dog walker, one of my main walking areas, which wasn't downtown Chicago. So I'm like, these are dogs that I only got to spend maybe an hour with every day. And I had some dogs that were very reactive that I had to say like, Hey, like we have to get in this elevator and we have to get through this walk. And I want that dog to trust that in my care and my handling, I got them, you know, like you don't have to figure, you don't have to worry about anything bad happened to you. I got you. 
Yeah. It, it sounds like a, a communication is just so important. Um, and just making the dogs feel like they can trust you, but it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier as like, you can't just expect dogs to say, you can't say to dog, trust me, <laughs> they're not a person. They're not a human. Um, so you need to understand like, what, how, how are they viewing the situation? Like how do they communicate rather than us putting our communication onto them? Yes. Would you exactly. agree with that? <laughs> exactly. You know, we really, we really have to, you know, mentor them in a way that they learn, you know, I could say like, I want to train you this way, but I could, I could try to do all those things. But if I'm not considering how you view the world and how you understand the world, that nothing is getting through. Yeah. Well, and I think another, another big thing that affects a lot of um, pet mentors, <laughs> pet owners, pet guardians, whatever we want to call them. Um, I think another thing that affects a lot of people these days is social media and seeing everyone's taking their dogs everywhere and everyone's going on these vacations with their dog and everyone's giving them pup cups, which I don't do myself, but um, everyone's doing all these things. So how does social media, how do you see it impacting pet ownership? Um, what are your observations on that? Yeah, you know, I feel like it's just the instant gratification, you know, um, you know, especially for city dogs, you know, there's a rescue is huge here in Chicago, you know, and, you know, a, a lot of these rescues do come with baggage, you know, um, and so I feel like social media really just shows you little snippets of things and it, it, it creates this false um this false expectation of like, you know, why isn't my dog progressing this fast? Or, you know, I saw a trainer, you know, do a sit two times in a city, you know, in a 30 second clip, you know? So I don't think it gives people the real, the bigger picture of like how to build that trust that we were just talking about, how to build that communication. And it, it does kind of start creating, you know, a world where dogs should be or, or a, a, a place where, where people expect to take their dogs everywhere. Like you said, we're like necessarily dogs don't belong everywhere. You know, it's, and, and you know, I'm the kind of person that I will try to do as many things that I can, like if my dog can come along. Um, but I feel like it just kind of becomes a, people just start posting things on social media just because it will get them likes, you know? So I, I can't tell you how many dog events there have been here in the city that I'm like, this is not a dog event for the dogs. This is a dog event for the people. Uh, you know, so I, I think that a lot of our perspective needs to change. And, you know, with this place that I'm opening, uh, Canine Corridor, we, one of our like values for that is making sure that the, the space that we create is for the dog, you know, and the human can tag along, right? But we want to make sure that we're putting the dog as a priority. Um, and I think that people that create these events and create this content need to really look at like, okay, what am I trying to portray in here? And I need to make sure that like the dog is always going to be first, you know, that's why my channel exists. You know, I like to be, I feel like realness is something that we kind of lack in the world now. Um, and so I'm, I'm really trying to build that, you know, with, with my site. And I think that social media, you know, if, if we start, you know, getting out of this, just pet influencers, and then just think about more like, you know, pet professionals like you and I, right. Like that do our, our due diligence. I and, and really like try to understand how, how, what the best thing for dogs are. Like those are the people that we need to amplify, you know, voices. Yeah. I love that so much. And I, I feel like sometimes it's hard for me. Um, sometimes I'm like, I have something great happening with my dogs, but one, it's like, really hard to capture on video because I'm usually by myself with them. Um, and then two, like, I think the most magical things that happen with the dogs are so subtle that you can't capture it on a video or a photo. It's like, just sometimes I can just tell the way that they look in my eyes. I'm like, Oh, they understand what I'm, what I'm trying to get them to do. Like they get it. It's clicking. Um, but it's just like a little glimmer of the eye. You can't really capture that. Um, in social media, and you're right, people have this, like, they want this instant gratification, but you might train, like, when I first got my dog, Bert, um, he was an adult, and he'd been in the rest, in the shelter for, like, over a year, and um, he just kind of forgot how to, like, sit, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he couldn't really, like, lay down. He just, he stood all the time, and I think it was because he was on concrete floors, you know, for so long, so he just stood a lot, and I remember taking him to a class, you know, it's like we like for weeks I was like, sit. And, and all of a sudden he was like, Oh, you mean this? I get it. Uh, and and you're like, like, yeah. Yeah. And there's like no way to really like get a video of that where anyone else watching it would be excited. Cause they were like, 
great. <laughs> He's sad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that you bring that up. Cause I mean, you know, something that we behavior specialists talk a lot about is that your behavior sessions are probably going to be the most boring sessions. And that means that it's going really well. Um, you know, but yes, you know, I feel like there's, there's this flashiness of social media and, and dogs that again, like it's, it just does us a disservice, right? Cause it also teaches us that dogs need to be like active doing things, doing these like hardcore tricks and all these, you know, crazy things where I'm like, you know, your dog is just happy be like being a dog and just being able to function in whatever environment you have them in. And yes, a lot of these things are super subtle. You know, I, I have a, uh, my, my newest dog cows, he's, he's very much a, a weirdo as I like to call them. Um, he's, you know, very sound sensitive, which is great in the city. Um, but you know, when I first got him as a puppy, he would like lunge at cars, you know, from very early on. Um, and you know, yesterday we were walking and, you know, we were kind of like in a corner where there was just a lot going on. And just the fact that he, instead of freaking out, he decided to just look up at me and like that, that warm feeling of like, he's like, I trust you, you know, you know that I, you know, nothing bad is going to happen. I can look up to you for help. Yeah. So those are things that, that are hard to capture, you know? Yeah. I, well, I, yeah, I have a big smile on my face. I'm like, I can understand. I can relate to that moment. But if you took a video of that, people would be like, uh, and like, what's the happening? <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, seriously. And I think that it's also like, you know, people are very disconnected nowadays from like being able to have like actual conversations. Right. And so, you know, talking to other people that have maybe bigger accounts than I do, uh, you know, they'll post a video and you immediately have people assuming things and calling you all kinds of things. And they're like, Whoa, like, you know, I have a client that um, is trying out a new harness on her dog. Her dog has like all these kinds of skin sensitivities and stuff. So she's like, I want to make sure it's something that's not like, you know, creating a rash or whatever. So, you know, she's trying it while putting a collar on, you know, so the dog is attached to the collar to walk fine whatever um and people were like hating on her because like well like, why isn't that clipped on the harness why isn't this like well and i'm like dude you don't even know the context like what like why are people so reactive you know i feel like it's we're, we live in a world where we as humans have become so reactive that like we could be triggered so easily and it's it's fine to be triggered but i think it's it's really important for us as humans to learn how to work through our own reactivities and decompress ourselves before we just kind of jump into something yes yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I wish that there was like, a, like a delay, like, you know, like live television has a delay. Like there should be a delay on commenting on social media where like, you can't, you can't just react immediately. You have to like wait three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's like, take, take a minute, take it in, you know? And, and luckily, you know, I, I, I've been really lucky to, you know, the, the, I, not that I have a like, huge following, right. But you know, the, the, the following that I have built is very much a small tent where people truly care. You know, I feel like I've really cultivated a space where, you know, I, I feel safe talking about very real feelings. You know, before we got on, I talked to you about me losing my, my Malamute um, a couple of weeks ago, which was, again, that's always like the hardest moment for, you know, any, any pet parent, pet owner, whatever. Um, but you know, I, I, I felt safe and comfortable being able to talk about that through, through my, um, to my Instagram, which obviously pet grief is not something that a lot of us talk about. I know you did a podcast on it recently as well. Um, but you know, I, I've been lucky to not have a lot of those people on my channel trying to, you know, talk shit and be stupid. And, you know, maybe the few times that somebody tried to raise a question, you know, I kind of talked about off leash dogs and I'm like, Hey, listen, like, obviously, you know, saying like all dogs need to be on leash and all that stuff, that's not working. Right. Like it's, 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 people are still doing it. Right. So for me, a big foundation is education is a big thing. It's like, let's teach people. If you want to have your dog off leash, these are the things that you need to do. If not, don't do it. Um, and immediately people kind of jumped the gun and were like, you know, how dare you say that? Like off leash dogs are fine. I'm like, whoa, you're not even listening. Like, did you read what I wrote? Like, did you, are you taking in what's going on? Or are you just like jumping into a conclusion? Because I said some a snippet of something that you didn't like you know oh yeah i know take a deep breath <laughs> exactly <laughs> um well daphne this has been such a great conversation um and you know our theme is about like continuing the conversation so where can people go to find you see your content and hopefully reach out and talk to you uh, yeah, you know, I'm 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 proud that I finally finished my website a couple months ago. So that's that that was up. That was one of my biggest. And it looks really nice. Year. Lots of videos on it and stuff. 
yes, you know, I'm a big artist. So I feel like there was a lot of, of, of artistry put into that, which I'm really excited about. Um, but yes, if you, you know, www.adogtrainerlife.org, that's my website. I'm also on Instagram, TikTok, a dog trainer life as well. You know, again, like, you know, the reason why I decided to, I don't even want to call it my company, right. But the reason why, you know, my, my career is what it's named a dog trainer life and not like Daphne's dog training or something is because this is what I preach. You know, it's what I've been living since I was a little kid. It's what I live with my dogs every single day. And it's, a very real perspective from just a pet professional who is, you know, rocking it with her dogs and having the best time. And I just want to share that with the world. Yeah. Well, and it's like, it's not just for you. It's like for everyone to live the dog trainer life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you again for your time and your insight. This was such a great conversation. Thank you so much. This was awesome. I, I appreciate everything that you do as well. So thank you for having me. Some of the best conversations happen after the episode. Send me a note on Instagram at wherewagrepeat or find even more women petpreneurs to connect with in our private Facebook group called Where Wag Repeat Labs. If you want to dig into more episodes, resources to grow your business, or find a link to something we discussed, it is all right there for you at wherewagrepeat.com. I'll see you back here next Wednesday for a fresh conversation.